the, the main message that I want to convey to you is that uh, we are faced with some unprecedented challenges in terms of the carbon balance on the planet and also on the economic forces at play around energy and chemistry. And uh, I wanted to start off this by giving you a, a perspective on what we talk about when we are conveying some messages about renewable energy and renewable fuels and chemicals. And instead of just focusing on one particular product, I wanted to give you an idea of what we face when we're really talking about replacing the whole barrel of oil. And uh, the title of the talk was a little uh, stilted. It's not replacing a barrel of oil, which we could probably do today, but replacing the whole barrel of oil for humanity to really enable this low carbon economy that you hear a lot about to address greenhouse gas emissions and other items. Um, exactly. So, but in order for a new low carbon bio-based economy to really become reality, it's not sufficient nor sustainable to just focus on one product. You really have to go after and understand that out of a single barrel of oil, you get diesel, other distillates, jet fuel, um, other products such as uh, polymers, heavy fuel oil, which is kind of the uh, residuals from a whole barrel of oil, liquefied petroleum gases, and of course, gasoline. Um, and this requires an integrated systems approach. And it's something that the scientific community and industry really haven't addressed yet because it's typically that you only hear about a single point solution. And what you need is a system of system solutions to make that happen. And also to put it in perspective, and I've heard you know, a lot of people around this neighborhood talk about, oh, it's just another Apollo space program or a moonshot and we'll be there. Um, not even close. The cost of oil imports, and this is not just from the United States, but China and the EU. In the United States, it was about 300 billion in 2010. That's two times the entire budget of the Apollo space program per year. Uh, in China, that's about 135 billion. That's five of the Three Gorges dams built each year. In the EU, uh, about 300 billion, same as the United States. It's 20 times the channel, which I don't think they have enough available coastline to actually make happen. And so, it, you know, it's an enormous problem. And to think that we're going to achieve the end state in 24 to 36 months just isn't practical. But that also opens up the door to significant advances in science and technology to make it both affordable and truly sustainable. And the goals in greenhouse gas emission reductions in, in the state of California is certainly leading the way, so applause there as well. We live in one of the best states in the nation in terms of greenhouse gas emission reductions. And AB32 set these really aggressive greenhouse gas targets to achieve 1990 levels by 2020, which from a science and technology perspective is right around the corner, uh, and 80% below the 90 levels by 2050. And the, there are a lot of advances that can happen in terms of renewable liquid fuels, batteries and fuel cells, and you have a bunch of different scenarios that have been uh, postulated to meet that goal. And so you have light duty vehicle scenarios, and I apologize for the slide being really small, but you have a bunch of different technology scenarios to help meet uh, the greenhouse gas emission reduction targets for the state. And then nationally, uh, there is a recent report called the Transportation Energy Futures, and I really encourage you to take a look at this report, that goes over the advanced fuels and advanced engines and technology sector crossover to make it happen. So there's a lot of hope out there, but there's not a, real, a lot of reality yet. And that's part of what we try to do at the place that I work at, the Joint Bioenergy Institute, is to help make the next transportation revolution happen sooner rather than later. And also to give you an idea of the baseline, uh, th these are the current estimates for renewable chemical production. So again, it's not just fuels, it's also chemicals. Uh, here's the bio-related sales in terms of billions. And you have you know, a whole list of products here uh, in terms of like ethanol and biodiesel for biofuels. Uh, you have natural rubber, polylactic acid, and polyols. But you sum it all up, and it looks really impressive, right? $95.5 billion in annual sales. But you put that in the context of the $4.7 trillion that we spend in this market each year worldwide, and it is a pittance. And so you really need to uh, be serious about it and appreciate the size of the problem before you can start addressing it. And building the sugar economy. A lot of what I'm going to talk about are uh, products that can be derived from sugar, realized from sustainable lignocellulosic biomass. And again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I do want to convey the message that pretty much everything that we derive from a barrel of oil we can replace based on biologically derived processes. So it's not a question of if, it's a matter of how much and how soon. And that is a, a, a real message of inspiration for me every day I wake up and that that's what makes me uh, go to work happy. And now, there's a lot of debate around food and fuel, or food versus fuel, in biomass and biofuels. 
Um, I want to point out this USDA DOE study that was uh, called affectionately the Billion Ton Study. And by telling you that, you probably understand the punchline already. Uh, but it projected that if you set aside food production, um, you set aside some of the conservation lands, and you really look at the deployment of agricultural resources and potential crops that could be dedicated for energy, um, it's about a billion tons by 2030. And so it, if you follow that through all the way to the chemical production element, a billion tons of this domestic sustainable biomass could produce about one third of the current demand for transportation fuels by 2030. But only if we have the conversion technologies available to convert that product, uh, convert that feedstock into a, a renewable uh, endpoint. And so to do that, what you need is this integrated pipeline to take advantage of the nat natural terrestrial biomass feedstocks and by this, we're talking about agricultural residues, hard softwoods, dedicated energy grasses. We're not talking about corn, and we're not necessarily talking about ethanol. At the place I work, we have a, several mantras that guide us in the day-to-day -day operations. First and foremost of those is that ethanol is for drinking and not for driving. And so what we're looking at is how can we take these natural feedstocks and convert them into drop-in replacement fuels for gasoline, diesel, and aviation. That's really where you get the impact. Because then you're not talking about the infrastructure concerns. You're not talking about a trillion dollars to distribute a new product. You're utilizing the existing infrastructure uh, to make those fuels happen. But first, you need to have the supply of those feedstocks. You need to really make the sugars from them, and then you need to convert them into those drop-in chemicals and fuels. And I'll highlight some of the examples here, but uh, really quickly, not all of these examples. Take a deep breath. And I've only got 51 seconds left, so it's almost over. Uh, but I want, wanted to highlight that this is a central metabolic map uh, in E. coli that demonstrates the variety of products that are produced naturally. And so the question is not what can we produce, but what should we produce? And so what we really want is BioShack, <laughs> right? Another message I want to convey to you is that we really want to establish a BioShack where we can uh, assemble our motherboards and our refineries uh, in a very systematic fashion. And one of the first examples that we did at the Joint Bioenergy Institute is make E. coli that could secrete biodiesel in the form of these fatty acid ethyl esters. And we did that by a relatively simple process of knocking out one enzyme and overexpressing the production of these fatty acid ethyl esters. Okay, I was wondering what was everybody applauding for. We're also doing methyl ketones in E. coli uh, as another diesel surrogate. Um, and I also just wanted to end with that there are other projects related to renewable energy in the Bay Area that are great. And they represent the whole full spectrum of solutions. And thank you very much.